Welcome back, boils and ghouls. If you enjoy these videos, hit that like button. Think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know. Share these videos with your friends. And if you really enjoy what you see, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about signing up for my Patreon page for exclusive behind the scenes updates and info, full scripts, uncut interviews, merchandise discounts, and you can even get a personal shout out on my next video. If Patreon isn't your thing, but you still wanna help out the channel, there's also also links to jerk comic shirts and tons of other merch in the description below. Thanks to everyone who's already supporting the channel. I can't tell you how much it means to me, but now it is trivia time. After stumbling across an interview with Alex Ross conducted by Chip Kidd a few months ago, I made the real reason Alex Ross won't paint digitally. In addition to Ross's stance on digital work, in passing, I also happen to mention Ross's rather infamous aversion to drawing new or alternate versions of costumes and character designs. This widely publicized proclivity first came to the forefront of conversation following a disagreement which took place between Alex Ross and the production team for Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 film back in 2004 and has managed to somehow haunt him ever since. While a disagreement did occur, the widespread discussion and wild exaggeration of the details of the argument led me and many others to believe that Alex Ross was somewhat of a prima donna refusing to draw any version of superhero costumes but the originals. When I thought about it though, Ross had become somewhat prolific in actually doing just that. Redesigning classic versions of characters, tweaking costume designs, and creating alternate versions of countless characters for Marvel and DC long before the film's release. His work on Kingdom Come instantly springs to mind, completed in 1996 and featuring veritably no original designs despite starring almost the entirety of the DC heavy hitters. Despite this, there had been a disagreement between Ross and the Spider-Man 2 production team. While I'd always surmised Alex Ross had some reasoning behind being difficult to work with during the film's production, I was never fully aware of what it was. Following the release of my previous video, however, as is often the case, curiosity got the better of me and I started digging. During my research to uncover the details of the disagreement and why the incident remains such an albatross around his neck, I inadvertently stumbled onto something of a looking glass which provided intriguing insight into Ross's thought process when it comes to costumes, designs, and most interestingly, the use of realism in his work. As I delved further into the subject, I discovered some of Ross's most deeply and long-held beliefs about how comic book characters should be drawn and designed, as well as why he prefers certain versions of costumes, why he paints them the way he does, and how this all ties back into the fundamental way in which Ross approaches and constructs his own work. As is often the case with Alex Ross, the answers were much more intelligent and contemplative than I would have ever imagined, and I thought I'd share some of what I found here with you all tonight. So, kick back, relax, and enjoy as we explore the real reason Alex Ross draws costumes the way he does in a little video essay I like to call Alex Ross vs. Realism. See, I come up with real titles every once in a while. Alex Ross burst onto the scene with some absolutely stellar work on the little-known Terminator Burning Earth for Now Comics as they went supernova in 1990. The crumbling company imploded only a few short months after the series' publication, and Ross wasn't even paid for the majority of his work, a fact he was none too pleased about. And if you want to learn more about that, check out my old episode about the banned Alex Ross Terminator cover. While the art on Burning Earth offered little more than a hint of what was to come, and things generally did not work out the way that Alex Ross planned, only a short time later he would create the two cornerstones upon which his career is based, 
Marvels and Kingdom Come for Marvel and DC Comics respectively. While the two stories share a lot more in common than one might think at first glance, Ross's artistic representation of the iconic characters inside are nearly as far apart as you can get. In 1996's Kingdom Come, we're thrust into a dark, dystopian, futuristic world plagued by the offspring of DC's Silver Age of heroes and villains. Nearly every panel is packed with the imagined second and third generation progeny of some of DC's most famous heroes, heroines, villains, and villainesses. The children of these metahumans, as they're called, have essentially overrun the Earth, and as one might expect, each one of these multitude of characters had to have a costume or at the very least a sort of outfit outfit, and Alex Ross was the one responsible for every single one of them, and there is a lot of them. They run the gamut from fanciful reimaginings of Golden and Silver Age costumes to completely new and original creations, but essentially none of them look like their Silver Age counterparts, with the exception of Ross's beloved Captain Marvel, who retains his original Golden Age appearance and normal Fred McMurray facial reference. While these new characters might not technically have redesigned costumes, things like Green Lantern's armor and Batman's exoskeleton are definitely new, and Kingdom Come always left me with the distinct impression that Alex Ross was at least open to altered designs, at least when they were done well and in the appropriate settings. In 1994's Marvels two years before, unlike Kingdom Come, Ross did not look to the future, but instead into the past, drawing on the original designs, deviating almost as little as possible from the iconic Marvel character's earliest appearances. His attention to detail is stunning, and Marvel's really does feel just about as close to real-life versions of the classic Marvel heroes jumping off of the page of their first appearances as you are likely to ever come across. But rather than say anything about Ross's artistic proclivities or personal preferences, this choice actually makes sense story-wise, as do the altered designs in Kingdom Come. Marvels takes place across several decades, chronicling the arrival of the Marvel era beginning in the 1940s Atlas and Timely Heroes and finishing during the heyday of the Kirby Lee collaborations of the 1960s. The reader is shown images of Marvel's biggest characters from some of their first and most famous appearances with very little deviation from the source material. That is with one major exception, Spider-Man. Ross's Spider-Man definitely did not look like the first appearance in Amazing Fantasy 15 or even Spider-Man number one. In fact, he doesn't look a whole lot like Steve Ditko's design at all. To be fair, I guess it's not that he doesn't look anything like Ditko's rendition, but given Ross's painstaking attention to detail, when it came to almost every other major Marvel character in Marvels, Spider-Man almost sticks out like a sore thumb once you notice it. While many of the images in Marvels are, Spider-Man is far from a literal translation of any of Ditko's original work on the character. While Spider-Man had been the entire reason I had learned about Ross's original costume fetishism, the version of Spider-Man that appeared in Marvels and most often throughout the rest of Ross's career certainly was not the unsettling, contorted figure from the first several years of Spider-Man's existence. In fact, the more you study Ross's Spider-Man illustrations, the more apparent it becomes he was influenced by John Romita more than anyone else. The more I thought about it, in Kingdom Come, Superman looked more like the Fleischer animation version than Siegel and Schuster's version of the character. And Ross has said openly in interviews repeatedly that he did in fact draw on that cartoon more than anything else for that version of Superman. And this was in the 1990s, 10 years before the whole Spider-Man 2 incident ever happened. All the gossip mongering, painting this narrative of Ross as a crazed eccentric refusing to draw any version of a character's costume other than the original just did not add up. There was a disagreement that took place during the production of Spider-Man 2 about his costume though, and I think I know what it was actually all about now.
Ross possesses this extraordinary ability to kind of distill a design down to its most effective and iconic form. This fact has left me in constant awe of his work for decades at this point, and in a recent interview for his YouTube channel, Ross revealed the details of the process that allow him this ability and how that's related to the versions of costumes and designs that he chooses to use and why. He explained that the most lasting and iconic characters around today spent years going through tweaks and revisions, passed from one artist to another until someone hit on that kind of perfect sweet spot, eliminating anything unpleasing from the original design without losing any of its original appeal while altering just enough elements to create an unforgettable artistic amalgamation. According to Ross, there's a point where a character has been revised after their first appearance, but before they stray too far from those original designs and lose that appeal, where they've achieved a perfect equilibrium, resulting in what is or what will become considered the most iconic version of that character, typifying all the recognizable attributes that will define them to coming generations. And he's right. It's never the first issue or hardly ever the first artist that define the most of the longest lasting superheroes, most iconic look or designs. Historically, there's been a process of refinement and distillation that takes place until one artist or another happens on that sweet spot and everything just kind of clicks and falls into place. Think of Wolverine or Batman, and even someone as simple in design as Superman, and you'll understand what he's talking about. It's not the cover of Detective Comics 27 that springs to mind. It's most likely a Neil Adams or an Adams-inspired design that pops into your head. No one likes that weird cat mask version of Wolverine, except for Alex Ross. But this is what Alex Ross is talking about. This is the version that Ross strives to capture in his illustrations. It has nothing to do with original costumes or designs and everything to do with the image that happens to come to mind for Alex Ross personally. What he sees as that idealized perfect version. Interestingly, and all things considered more than a little ironically, Spider-Man is perhaps the best example of this ability to combine and distill different influences and designs as a character is passed from one artist to another and in turn therefore subject to an ever-increasing amount of interpretation and variance from their first appearance. The fact that Ross would become so notorious for only drawing original costumes because of Spider-Man is strange and honestly somewhat confusing because, as I mentioned, Ross's Spider-Man is much more heavily influenced by John Romita's work than anything Steve Ditko ever did. And Ditko was the artist on not only the original 30 plus issues of Amazing Spider-Man, but also his first appearance in Amazing Fantasy 15 and he even designed the character. So presumably, Ross wanted to draw the Romita-inspired Spider-Man design because it was his preferred version, but why had he insisted on this fact to the point where it became a vitriolic argument with production and a matter of public record constantly popping up in news media outlets at the time? Why was Ross so protective of this version of Spider-Man? Now, Alex Ross loves Spider-Man. He always has. While he's worked with the majority of the biggest properties in the history of the medium, Ross seems far more protective of Spider-Man than any of the other multi-billion dollar characters that he routinely illustrates today. And that's saying something given Ross's love and admiration of these characters, their creators, and their history. While almost exclusively associated with the DC pantheon of characters for nearly half a decade following Kingdom Come's release in 1996, Ross has always seemed to take immense pleasure in rendering images of the wall crawler, so much so that Spidey was one of the few Marvel characters that Ross routinely painted for not only people like Wizard Magazine, but even official Marvel projects, even while he was still employed by their largest competitor. That basically just does not happen. Ross obviously goes out of his way to not only accept any offer for the character that he might get, but he also seems to go out of his way to find Spider-Man assignments in a lot of cases. This isn't just because he's obsessed with Spider-Man for no reason either though. 
Apparently, Spider-Man was basically Ross's gateway into the world of comics during his childhood in every way you could think of, and this is probably the reason why Ross seems so overly protective of the character. As a child, Alex Ross's first real exposure to comics essentially all came in the form of Spider-Man. First, it was the Electric Company television show, which featured educational live-action Spidey Super Stories segments, which starred Spider-Man. These shorts featured a dancer named Danny Seagren in a spandex suit, but not an expensive one or one that necessarily fit him. Spider-Man only communicated using word balloons, and despite the fact that Marvel provided the character for educational purposes completely free of charge, no other Marvel characters ever appeared on the Electric Company Spidey Super Story shorts. Also, due to budgetary limitations, instead of special effects, the Electric Company would use interspersed panels from actual Spider-Man comic books. They weren't anything amazing, but it was the first live action depiction of a Marvel character since the Captain America serials in the 1940s, and many believe that it's kind of paved the way for the Spider-Man television show, which would begin airing only three years later. Despite the low production values, something about seeing someone in that suit sparked his young imagination, and Alex Ross instantly fell in love with the design. Ross was not alone, either. Stan Lee and President of Marvel Jim Galton both believed that television exposure was essential to bringing in new readers, and the Electric Company Spidey Super Stories were an important stepping stone for an idea that wouldn't really come to fruition until the release of the Robert Downey Jr.-led Iron Man film in 2007. While it's long been a somewhat controversial topic, with both fans and industry professionals, there's no denying the lasting impact that these shorts had on Ross during his adolescence. Soon after becoming obsessed with Spider-Man's appearance on The Electric Company, his father also happened to start buying him the Spidey Super Stories comic book. Spidey Super Stories basically invariably consisted of not so wonderfully written or illustrated, semi educational stories and situations which were in actuality a ploy to introduce new and younger readers to establish Marvel properties. The series was done in conjunction with the Electric Company and featured even more castrated versions of the characters than the already simplified child-friendly plots than the average Marvel comic at the time, with there being not only one but two editorial review boards, one from Marvel and one from the Electric Company as well. While Spidey Super Stories was an even more watered-down version of that already child-friendly version of Spider-Man appearing in the monthly title, it did feature several big-name superheroes, including Iron Man and Miss Marvel, although she was kind of a nobody at the time, as well as appearances by villains like the Green Goblin and most famously, or infamously, I should say, Thanos and his Thanos Copter in issue 39. While it did kind of whet your appetite to a certain degree as a kid and managed to run for 57 issues across almost 8 years, Spidey Super Stories was hokey and not like in a good way or a way that even makes me nostalgic looking back on it. More than anything, the fact this series could be had for cheap was kid friendly and was found basically anywhere that sold comics or books made it so readily accessible to so many people that it was bound to turn a few people on to comics. Also of interesting note, while a guy named Wynn Mortimer did most of the art for Spidey Super Stories, the Marvel editor on the title was none other than legendary Spider-Man super scribe himself, John Romita, who actually contributed a few covers to the series himself. Despite its rather simplistic nature, both art and story-wise, Spidey Super Stories played an essential part of building the way Alex Ross saw and thought of not only comic books, but the reality of the characters inside of them from a young age. While Spidey Super Stories, which featured a distinctly Romita-inspired Spider-Man design for obvious reasons, played an enormous part in shaping how Ross perceived the character, the live-action Electric Company shorts featuring a guy in this cheap spandex suit left a rather interesting and lasting impression on a young Alex Ross as well.
He realized from an early age that Spider-Man was a real person because of those shorts. He existed in three dimensions, not on paper. And as such, in Ross's mind, he should be represented that way even when he was on paper. In essence, Spider-Man was just as real as you or me to Alex Ross when he was illustrating him from the time of his adolescence, and this is probably one of the keys to why his illustrations are capable of looking so lifelike and realistic. He's literally been trying to achieve this effect since he was a child. In 1994, Alex Ross was given his first professional opportunity to tackle Spider-Man, along with just about every single one of Marvel's other big characters in his seminal four-issue limited series, Marvels. In Marvels, Alex Ross distilled and drew on the designs and outfits from essentially every one of the characters' first appearances. There are other little things that you can point to with several of the other characters in Marvels, but Spider-Man, while true to the original Ditko design in many regards, incorporated ideas and elements from a number of others as well, chiefly John Romita, and is distinctly different in several regards to Alex Ross's approach to most of the other characters in Marvels. This isn't because Alex Ross thinks Ditko's design is subpar in any way, but traces back to his fundamental approach to how he draws and thinks of costumes. Ditko's version of Spider-Man was far from his first exposure to the character and isn't what pops into his head when he thinks about the character. Ramita is. Many of the other characters that he illustrates, he probably discovered directly through comics later and therefore has a much more pure and comic-centric view of. This means that even my most fundamental perception of some of Ross's most famous work was completely off base, and it did not stop there. What Ross had to say next about costumes and how he approaches realism in his work was an eye-opener for me. While his work is synonymous with realism, Ross has often dismissed it as a label for reference for his work. I don't necessarily think the term isn't apt, I just think there's a fundamental disconnect between how Ross approaches his work and how people who see it interpret it. While many of his detractors only see guys in spandex tights and often complain of excessive photo references, which make his characters look stiff or posed, Ross's own perception and approach to his work is almost a complete juxtaposition. Though Ross does sometimes dress his models, with few exceptions, Ross never really had the money for complete costumes and uses his photo reference more for lighting, posture, and facial expression than anything else, especially these days. It's actually kind of weird when you see a lot of the newer photo reference because it's basically just the pose and lighting that make their way into the composition with Ross himself standing in for even multitudes of characters in some of his most famous works. He isn't painstakingly reproducing every fold and shadow in expensive costumes meant to replicate what these characters would look like in real life. Instead, Ross uses these photos as a way to integrate elements of the way we perceive the world around us in order to make compositions appear more complete and fleshed out. His goal is not, nor has it ever been, to illustrate the characters as realistically as possible, but in the most dynamic and archetypal ways instead. What's most interesting about this, at least to me, is that it means the costumes essentially come out of Ross's head. He's not just copying photographs of people in spandex suits, as this would not accomplish his goal. Ross does not see these costumes as real objects at all, apparently. They're something wholly different, an extension of the characters themselves. One of Ross's biggest pet peeves and something he talks a lot about is that while they're often referred to as spandex superheroes, spandex has only really been around for something like 50 years. This means the people who created most of the classic and iconic heroes and villains that he's become so famous for rendering didn't even know what spandex was if it existed at all when they were designing those costumes. Not that this stops this widespread misconception, which, along with the term 
funny book are perhaps the two biggest insults you can lob at professionals like Alex Ross. He rejects this notion of spandex superheroes on every level, and he has a darn good reason for it. Interestingly, when he discusses which characters take him the longest, it's always guys like Colossus and Iron Man because of the reflective nature of the metal in their designs. It's not because of some sort of all-consuming need for Ross to spend time rendering every scale on Captain America's armor perfectly. To Ross, as with all characters' costumes, Tony Stark's armored exoskeleton is just an extension or an exaggeration of the anatomy of the human being underneath, not a separate construct. For Ross, it isn't about achieving something that's real. The characters aren't real, and neither are the costumes, and Ross doesn't stress about trying to somehow illustrate them as if they were real objects, as opposed to trying to illustrate these imaginary objects with as many elements of reality as possible. This is why Alex Ross has a proclivity to draw from the more stripped down and minimalist Iron Man armor of the late 70s and early 80s, despite its lackluster popularity, as opposed to the hulking construct from his original first few appearances, or even the sleek but heavily robotic appearance that's become so prevalent in the comics following the success of the film in 2007. Going back to Spidey's super stories, Ross understands that these characters are fictitious, but when he pictures them in his head, thanks in no small part to Danny Seagren and the electric company apparently, he sees them in three dimensions, as living, breathing beings that inhabit a fully formed world inside of his head. This is the same world where Ross draws his imagery from, and thanks to his heavy background in anatomy and drawing, Ross has developed a rather unique view and approach to constructing and illustrating costumes which I don't think I've ever heard of before. A purist in many regards when it comes to design, but also extremely schooled in anatomy and drafting, Ross has thoroughly rejected the notion that superheroes wear spandex from early on in his career, taking a completely different approach to their creation and illustration. Ross asserts that the public's widely held misconception about superhero costumes is in large part due to the Christopher Reeve Superman films, which also affected him pretty heavily in his youth, but not necessarily in the most positive light. While the Superman films enjoyed a great deal of success and turned Reeve into a household name, with few people anywhere in the world not instantly recognizing the dashing young man outfitted with the iconic Superman onesie people so lovingly associate with the film series today, it's also a good example of why spandex really doesn't work as a superhero costume, according to Ross, and he ain't lying. If you look at that film with Reeves' physique in mind, you'll probably notice how he doesn't really appear to be that big or have done much bulking up for the role at all. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. Reeve had spent months of completing intense amounts of physical preparation for the role with David Prowse, the actor who played Darth Vader in fact, and Reeve was seriously cut by the time filming began. Not that you could tell once they got the costume on him though, and once they stuck that suit on him, every contour and curve on his body disappeared into the unflattering mess that was his costume, and this fact was not lost on a young Alex Ross, who paid astute attention to such details. Reeve, in fact, looks more like a gangly reporter dressed as Superman than he does as Clark Kent if you actually watch the movie and the studio knew they had something of a problem on their hands but didn't really know how to solve it. Everyone had known it was going to be a difficult proposition translating design onto film and they brought in legendary Yvonne Blake who had taken home an Oscar for a work that same year in 1978 to try and solve it. Battling against everything from color schemes, the suit was originally supposed to be a much darker blue resembling the comic, but uh, disappeared and became discolored by the green screen effects required to make Superman fly at the time. The original spandex suit was way too hot, and Blake discovered a breathable German fabric which actually absorbed the problematic sweat made by Bermans and Nathans in London. Once this was done though, the suit looked... Uh, tad inappropriate. 
there were, quote, lumps and bumps, as Blake described, and they had to end up designing a series of special plastic projection shields, usually worn by boxers. The studio was worried, and while Blake battled against the odds and did her best, apparently the studio weren't the only ones who knew they had a problem. Even after filming began, it was still an issue, and after Reeve was shown dailies of himself in his costume, he proceeded to double down on his workout regimen in an attempt to try and beef up even further for the role, hoping that if he got big enough, you might actually catch a glimpse of a muscle or a contour of his body, which were obfuscated almost entirely by the suit. While he was never fully successful, and Superman doesn't appear nearly as strong and muscular as he should, given what Reeve looked like out of costume, as a result of his workout regimen, the traveling mat shots seen in the opening of the film, which were among some of the very first shots completed, actually had to be entirely redone because Reeve got so big there was a noticeable difference between the beginning and ending of production. Apparently, even in the movies, spandex does not work as a superhero costume. Following Reeve, Hollywood began to paint and chisel bodysuits for actors in subsequent comic films, eliminating spandex or similar materials from their repertoire almost entirely for the most part. They instead embraced molded bodysuits, and in the case of actors such as Robin Wright, simply extenuating their natural form. Hollywood began to treat costumes as a sort of extension of the actors in many cases, and despite Hollywood's complete inaccuracy when it comes to translations from the page to the screen, this is ironically almost exactly how Ross feels as well. Superhero costumes aren't real suits in any sort of the word. They're not cut from real cloth or forged of actual steel. Ross instead simply sees them as an extension of the character, the physical form underneath of the costume that actually composes the character in Ross's eyes. A master of the human form, Ross simply renders the human anatomy in its most pure state before then embellishing that with the costumes, saying in essence his characters aren't actually wearing anything. For Alex Ross, this extrapolation of the idealized human form underneath, which actually comprises and informs the costume that you see, is what makes people perceive his paintings as realistic, although this is not his intent, but rather an unintended side effect of his approach. Ross is still trying to just get those pictures of that Spidey Super Stories electric company guy out of his head the way he sees them. He just has a lot more training and practice and talent now. For a guy who is so well known for realism, and it is one of the most often repeated terms when his work comes up, but for someone who's synonymous with realism, amazingly, Ross doesn't even make any attempt to render the costumes as if they were real objects in any way, shape, or form. He doesn't necessarily worry about making every single scale on Captain America's suit look real or drawing every rivet and joint in Iron Man's armor. His work is not about that. Instead, Ross simply sees costumes as natural extensions of the anatomical shapes that comprise the subjects in his paintings as filtered through their character and personality. In other words, costumes are just another way to embellish who the character is underneath the costume as much as their outward appearance. As his grasp on the human form and how to play and toy with that form have broadened and expanded, so is his ability to render costumes as a result, and Spider-Man is perhaps the best visual guide to the evolution of Ross's art for that very reason, despite his appearance being such a millstone around Ross's neck for decades now. You can see as Ross started picking up different bits and pieces from all of these different interesting places, Ramita and Ditko and the Electric Company and integrating new ideas and approaches into Spider-Man and later his work in a much broader sense. Spider-Man has more than maybe any other singular character helped Ross hone his approach to costumes. And as the years tick by, Ross became not only more and more prominent in the industry, but more and more synonymous with Spider-Man as well.
By the end of the 1990s, Alex Ross's star was rising and his name was showing up more and more places. Then in 2000, as comics began to emerge as a powerful new force at the box office, Ross made what seemed like an almost inevitable break into Hollywood. He contributed some art for M. Night Shyamalan's film Unbreakable, starring Bruce Willis, and Alex Ross was even featured discussing superheroes on the special features of the DVD released the following year, and things seemed to be going fine. There were comic films happening, but it wasn't like it is today, with a new Marvel or DC film coming out what seemed like every six months. While there wasn't nearly as much work to go around, this time Ross was approached about what you would imagine was an absolute dream job in either late 1999 or early 2000. He was asked to do the costume designs for Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. But unbeknownst to me and a lot of other people, Ross was likely a little less enthused and a little more worried about the assignment than anything else. It wasn't that Alex Ross thought that he would botch the design or even that he didn't have faith that Sam Raimi could direct the film. It was just that following the release of Brian Singer's X-Men, he had become more and more disillusioned with Hollywood's apparent complete lack of respect when it came to source material that they were drawing from. The actual designs from the comics for many of the iconic characters that they were beginning to adapt for the big screen were either inherently dismissed were completely ignored for a bevy of what Ross argued were nonsensical reasons. The characters in the finished films bore little resemblance to their comic book counterparts, and more troubling to Ross was what he perceived as a complete dismissal of the characters' history and appeal, something that he could not abide given his own personal love and passion about these very things. What he found perhaps most disturbing, though, was that this phenomenon was no longer being confined to film, but had begun to spill over into comics as well. In fact, Alex Ross had been attempting to get more involved with new and redesigned costumes both in and out of Hollywood over this period as more and more bizarre new costumes and redesigns emerged throughout the early 2000s completely destroying decades of history and defiling classic designs with needlessly bizarre new additions or outright replacements. Throughout this time, which featured a period of fad chasing during the 1990s, which resulted in some not only dreadful but outright unneeded costume redesigns and changes, comics were attempting to fall more into line with the realistic approach the films were taking to costumes rather than the other way around as Ross believed that it should be. In X-Men, Singer chose to ignore basically every single character's costume and instead decided to redesign the X-Men's costumes entirely. However, rather than make anything interesting or unique to any of the characters, Singer and his production instead chose to go with a simple black leather flight suit, the obligatory X's tacked on them and call it a day. The result was one of the most visually abhorrent and underwhelming adaptations in recent memory. It also stripped many of the characters of some of their essential core traits by eliminating their costumes. So when Marvel Comics announced that they would be doing a complete redesign of the X-Men for the upcoming Grant Morrison title, New X-Men, in hopes of following more in line with the film, Ross felt it was his responsibility to toss his hat in the ring and at least attempt to come to the rescue of these iconic characters. Despite the fact that Ross has admitted numerous times throughout his career, he's not a really big X-Men fan. But I don't think this was about the X-Men. I think this was about history and respect for Ross more than anything else. Movies were one thing. There were limitations around every bin, but comics, where the characters had originated and no limits save your imagination and talent to hold you back, well, that was a completely different story. 
Knowing Marvel was going to change things with or without his input, he hoped to salvage at least some of the iconic elements of the original designs and tossed himself into his work with his usual fervor. Ross did redesigns of the entire main X-Men lineup at the time, which did a rather amazing job of amalgamating the new darker leather flight suits from the films with the iconic designs of the originals. They were clever and they checked all the boxes and in the end it didn't matter because Marvel went with Frank Quietly's redesigns. Quietly's redesigns were essentially what you saw in the movies, these bland, dark, leather looking things that didn't really have any masks or any other trademark comic book tropes. Apparently, after investing a lot of time and work, while admittedly on spec and with no promise of the designs being used, Ross was not pleased Marvel had decided to go in another direction because as he put it, quote, quietly was the hot artist at the time and I can't blame him or in fact argue with him. While Marvel didn't use Ross's redesigns, that doesn't mean there wasn't interest in the work. In fact, his proposed redesigns of the X-Men first showed up in the Wizard Magazine X-Men Spectacular issue only a few short months later in 2001, before then being reprinted in several publications over the next year or two, including Millennial Visions, X-Men by Marvel Comics themselves. Ross's concept art was the centerpiece of an entire article in the Wizard Magazine, and it was one of the first undeniable signs that Ross had truly emerged as a superstar artist. Even his rejected concept design work was in such high demand it saw print on at least three different occasions. With the exception of Cyclops, who has this enormous weird hood, I was really taken with his ability to extrapolate what was important and worked about the original X-Men designs and successfully combine that with the leather clad look, which I admittedly loathe to no end. While these redesigns remain unused to this day, he slipped some of them in as cameos in his latest series, Marvel, and they certainly made the rounds, which is doubly intriguing given Ross's purported proclivity for original designs according to a growing majority of the press that he received just following this. Ross and his strong stance on costumes were about to be front page news, he just didn't know it yet. After his defeat at the hands of Quietly on the X-Men redesigns only a year before, Ross felt even more pressure to make sure the designs he was asked to contribute to Spider-Man were that much better. I don't know how long he worked on them or how much he was paid, but I do know the production ended up not using any of Ross's designs and went with the raised webbing suit that you saw in the film. I also know that Alex Ross was not pleased with this fact. I don't remember hearing about him going off about it or anything at the time, but I do know that the raised webbing design felt very out of place for the character and just did not work for him according to several interviews. They weren't scathing words, but by this time Alex Ross had learned to play his hand rather close to his chest and despite his misgivings about the costume, he was subsequently asked to contribute original art for the opening title sequence of the sequel. Then Ross did something very few other artists would likely have the stones to do, something that would earn him a reputation and garner headlines around the world. He stood up to the Hollywood machine. Disliking the raised webbing, sore that his designs hadn't been used and fed up with Hollywood's apparent refusal to pay any attention to the source material, Ross refused to paint Spider-Man in the altered costume. This in and of itself might not have been so much of a problem, but Ross didn't just not paint what they told him to. Instead, he decided to simply paint what he wanted to. Displeased with the raised webbing on the suit, he opted not to paint it and didn't contribute a single image of the main character of the film in his iconic costume if you pay attention to the art in the title sequence of Spider-Man 2. Instead, Ross decided to focus on the few things that did manage to capture his interest, like the amazing portrait of Willem Dafoe he did 
In the end, though, I get the feeling there wasn't much, which resulted in Ross producing far fewer images than were expected. And I think that this caused a fairly big hassle for production who had planned and timed a title sequence around a set number of images. He contributed only 15 original paintings for the title sequence of Spider-Man 2 and all, but if you watch that movie, you'll notice there appears to be a lot more than just 15 paintings by Alex Ross. This is because the production used digital technology to actually alter actual stills from the film to look like Alex Ross had painted them. While I've never read a super in-depth interview with Alex Ross where he tackles it, the fact that the production chose to use digital technology to replicate the look of his art rather than get him to do more pieces likely means a few things. Firstly, Ross wasn't having a lot of discussion when it came to the suit's design. He probably was not pleased that his designs hadn't been used. I know he was salty about Marvel having gone in another direction with their X-Men designs, and by this point, he was famous enough that he simply refused to paint anything he didn't want to. Secondly, he was so resolute in this that the production felt like it was a more economically feasible option to use digital means to replicate his art style rather than persuade Ross to see things their way or have alternate images produced in an attempt to replicate Ross's style. Ross, while very well spoken and thoughtful today, a consummate businessman careful not to offend or say anything that could be perceived as untoward was still phasing his much more opinionated personality out at this time and made no secret of the problems with the Spider-Man 2 production. While Alex Ross probably didn't think a whole lot about it while it was happening, this series of events and his willingness to discuss them would have unintended and lasting consequences on his career and reputation. Starved for news relating to the burgeoning comic book film market, national news agencies latched on as this story blew up. There weren't a million comic book movies going on at the time, and people were looking for any gossip that they could get. Alex Ross going rogue and telling off the corporate giants of Hollywood quickly became the stuff of legend. Everyone was abuzz with stories about how difficult and testy Ross could be when it came to designs and costumes, and how difficult he could be to work with. There were a few times when I know Ross's feelings actually got a little bit hurt by comments made by those inside the comic industry, but in the end, rather than fight it, Ross somewhat embraced this gossip mongering and used it to his advantage. He took the opportunity to render his favorite heroes and villains in the costumes that he wanted for years and did little to downplay the erroneous assumptions made about his difficult attitude to afford him more leverage when negotiating and turning in work. It was rather ingenious. Ross has obviously never been afraid of costume redesigns. Yes, he prefers the original designs in most cases, but he's also never been incapable of admitting when something new and better is introduced. These were usually small, intricate little details, but this along with the absolutely ludicrous amount of designs he's done for everything from Earth X and Kingdom Come to the 2020 relaunch of Iron Man and the 1991 Iron Man relaunch as well for that matter, all should have made it quite apparent he was never afraid of changing things up. Ross is simply a traditionalist and a purist in many ways, a studied student and ardent lover of comics history and lore, and he's simply weary of wandering too far from the magic of those original designs, something he's seen all too often, not only during his long career, but as a fan of the medium in his younger days as well. As he's done more and more cover work, and work in general in fact, today it feels like Alex Ross is kind of lightened up a little bit, and he seems to be much more open to current designs and costumes than he was decades ago. For a long time I thought maybe it was just so he could get more work, but it turns out that it was more likely because he never really had a rule against it in the first place just a preference that got really blown out of proportion, and all because 
he wouldn't bend to the will of a Hollywood film. Ross has also spoken rather extensively on the reason he approaches every one of his paintings with such exacting detail and precision, being rooted in the fear or perhaps resolute knowledge he might not ever get to do another image of that particular character ever again. In his eyes, this means every single image needs to be as good as he can possibly make it according to his own exacting standards and presented in the way that he chooses for fear he never get to spend time with that particular character ever again. An admirable belief to be sure, in my opinion, and one I can definitely say I mirror with my own fears and beliefs. Ross has also recently tackled his current thoughts on costumes and redesigns in a couple of interviews talking about how he's moved away from many of his original designs. Over time, he's realized that they were really his versions of the characters and were nowhere near as true to the original designs as he once believed or wanted them to be. Superman has been undergoing a fairly steady transformation for a number of years under Ross's brush, especially since the reemergence of his Kingdom Come version of the character in the pages of JSA some years ago, which allowed him more than ample time and compositions to perfect his rendition on. As I've mentioned, Spider-Man has undergone steady and subtle changes, but more recently, Ross's Thor and Captain America have also begun to really evolve. With these and many other examples, Ross has constantly proven over his storied career that he's more than capable of change and evolution when it comes to every facet of his work and approach to composition. While he's certainly mindful and knowledgeable of the past and what's come before, he also doesn't believe in becoming a slave to it. After all, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Much like his belief on realism, Ross says that his take on costumes is boiled down to the basic fundamentals he learned in figure drawing. The human form. Nothing more, nothing less. Costumes shouldn't have to stand on their own, they're not meant for that. They simply need to extenuate the form and personality of the person underneath the disguise in the best possible ways while allowing for artistic expression in a visual medium like comics at the same time. In essence, Alex Ross's superhero costumes are just a way of showing the human shape with minimal interference and maximum artistic influence. Thanks so much for sticking with me. I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If you did like what you saw, make sure you hit that like button. Think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know. Share these videos with your friends. And if you really enjoyed what you saw, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell so you never miss another video or premiere ever again. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about using the link in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page for exclusive behind the scenes posts, uncut interviews, full scripts, discounts on merchandise, and even a personal shout out on the channel. Speaking of which, this episode was brought to you by the Jerk Broadcasting Corporation, as well as grants from the generous patrons you see on the screen right now. I'd like to personally thank Weapon X Squall, David Arroyo, Mike Dolan, and the newest Wednesday warrior, Jason, for making this video possible. I seriously can't thank you all enough for supporting the channel and help making these videos possible. I cannot wait to see where the next year takes me and the channel, and none of this would be possible without amazing viewers like yourselves. If you want to support the channel but Patreon is not your thing, there's links to jerk comic shirts and tons of other merch in the description as well. Thanks again for sticking with me. Thank you to everybody who signed up for Patreon or picked up a shirt. And as always, I really, truly, and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics.